Hello and welcome back to the IEA channel. I'm Emily Carver, Head of Media at the Institute of Economic Affairs. Today I'm joined by Tom Whipple, Science Editor at The Times, Professor Len Shackleton, who's the Editorial and Research Fellow at the IEA, and Annabelle Denham, Director of Communications at the Institute of Economic Affairs. Today we're going to be discussing the economics of beauty. We often talk about gender, race, sexuality, and disability when looking at discrimination in the workplace, but we rarely talk about the impact beauty may have. Tom described lookism in a recent column for the Times as the great unspoken prejudice of our time. You can read Tom's column, Ugly People Are Seen as Second Class Citizens by following the link in the description box. So if you are ugly, are you a member of an unrecognized, unchampioned minority, as Tom suggests? Is beauty a key indicator of economic success? And does being attractive make you more employable or more likely to move your way up the career ladder? And if it's true that being less attractive puts you at a, dis at a disadvantage, why might this be? And lastly, if we agree that there is a level of discrimination in the workplace against the unfortunate looking among us, what are the policy implications of this? Could beauty be the new gender pay gap? So let's start with what we know about the economic results of good looks. Tom, you've cited a number of studies in your column showing that there are pay differentials between attractive and less attractive people. What does the research tell us? Um, to what extent can we say being looking, being good looking is an indicator of economic success? Um, so there's, there's quite a lot of research over quite a long period of time. I wouldn't say it's massively high quality. It's not like statistics that we have on gender or race where you're looking at the whole workforce. I mean, the, these, uh, these studies all, all suffer from the fact that people aren't sort of graded precisely on their, their attractiveness from birth and then that's put into some sort of ONS data. Um, but the most of the studies all point in roughly the same direction. Um, so uh, being one found, for instance, that being attractive and a man gives you roughly a 5% pay boost, whereas being unattractive and a man gives you roughly a 4% pay cut. Um, similar levels for women. Um, there was a, a more recent study that looked at, uh, th thankfully we have in recent years gained better data on attractiveness because there's a website called Rate My Professor, um, which showed that, that hotter economics professors uh, seem to earn, I think, about 6% more. Um, and, and so, yes, the, there's data, and this, this, of course, ties in with all sorts of other data on the effect of attractiveness. Um, you know, we find that if, if, we, if you show people pictures of attractive people, they're rated as more kind and warm and trustworthy. Um, and, you know, there's analysis of the criminal justice system that shows that you're more likely to be arrested and more likely to be convicted if you're ugly. Um, and you are more likely to lose elections. This is where we do get pretty good data. Um, I think there was a recent analysis of the German Bundestag elections that, that found that being the more attractive candidate gave you about a 3.84% uh, boost in the polls. Um, so it does seem like there are quite strong advantages to being um, attractive and there aren't obvious explanations as to why it would be anything other than just the fact that you're attractive. <laughs> Len, you mentioned in um, a blog post that you wrote on this a couple of years ago that there's been studies that have actually shown that um, highly attractive women can be at a disadvantage if you believe them. Um, apparently they're seen to be less trustworthy than uh, less attractive women and men. Does this uh, go any way to undermining Tom's thesis there? Is this proof that discrimination can work in both ways when it comes to looks, or does most of the literature agree with what Tom's saying? I think most of the literature agrees with Tom. The, the particular study I was referring to there was a rather crudely conducted study, I think. It's involved um, uh, a series of, of um, made-up statements uh, which were associated with um, a set of pictures of, of, of individuals who were supposedly making them, and the statements were less believed by uh, if they were made by people who are looking very, very beautiful. 
uh, quite what that meant, I don't know. And it certainly doesn't feed through into any evidence about people losing out at interviews because they're too beautiful or anything like that. I think it was a, I think it's a rogue study in relation to the literature, uh, quite honestly. Uh, but I mean, if I could just uh, sort of put, put all this in a, a bit of context, you will find um, gaps in pay between any discernible groups you want to mention, whether it be people with blue eyes, green eyes, trained spotters and non-trained spotters, uh, you know, that, anything at all, left-handed people, right-handed people. And the question is whether this is actually of any great importance uh, in the labor market. Uh, and also where it comes from. I mean, it's interesting, Tom mentioned there the, uh, the, the, the um, effect of, of voting, right? And uh, there is a lot of evidence, of course, that, that, that um, these, these, um, these uh, pay gaps due to beauty or ugliness or whatever are really down to consumer taste as much as anything else. I mean, it was a very good study by Daniel Hammermesh and a, and a colleague a few years ago, which uh, looked at defense lawyers and those who were um, uh, better looking got more gigs, essentially. But this, were, this, this wasn't an employer discrimination thing because it was also true of the self-employed lawyers that the, that the better looking ones got more, got more um, opportunities and more pay as a consequence. So it is, I, I think, as, as Tom was suggesting, it's something fairly deeply inbred in us. It's not down to nasty employers. It's, you know, we're all like this. People who go on Tinder are like this, aren't they? You know, they're basically looking for attractive people rather than unattractive people. So, Annabelle, it's just our, it's just our innate biases towards uh, pleasant looking people. What did you find when you were looking at um, how entrepreneurs deal, um, you know, with, with pictures and so on from attractive men and attractive women? Yeah, so thank you for inviting me on, Emily. Um, it, funnily enough, the first time that I did a broadcast media bid, it was about um, the story when Clarissa Farr, who was high, uh, headmistress at St Paul's Girls' School, uh, she'd come out and she'd said that attractive women have more authority in the boardroom. She, I think, erroneously said that when you Google the word CEO, then you find pictures of uh, old men with grey hair. Um, and really what she was suggesting was that very successful uh, women, uh, such as Sheryl Sandberg or Helena Morrissey, had managed to climb the greasy pole because of their looks, which obviously does delegitimizes their many achievements. And it's, I wouldn't have thought particularly accurate representation or a conclusion to come to. And at the time I looked into um, a piece of research around uh, investment into female led businesses. Now we know that women only get a penny in every pound or all female teams only get a penny in every pound of VC investment. And that could explain why we do have a bit of a gender entrepreneurship gap. But this piece of research found that uh, while investors did indeed prefer picture, pictures presented by male entrepreneurs compared to those pitched by female entrepreneurs, um, even when the content of the pitch, pitch is the same, it was actually attractive men who were particularly persuasive, whereas physical attractiveness didn't matter among female entrepreneurs. Um, so I, what was quite interesting about that story in the context of Clarissa Farr's comments was that I think when we talk about the economics of beauty, we often try to find a gender divide. We try to suggest that in some way it impacts women more than it does men. By we, I mean, as a society, groups like the IEA try to push back against these notions. But I think, you know, ultimately, I'd, I'd echo what both Tom and Len have said, Tom, you know, about how robust the data really are when what you're measuring is so subjective and what Len has said about how you can really identify um, or try to identify discrimination if you look hard enough in any range of areas. Yeah, um, Tom, one of the um, explan explanations for, um, for uh, why attractive men and women might do better in certain roles is simply because of uh, rational occupational sorting. So that's to say that attractive men and women gravitate towards certain occupations where good looking, personable, self-confident people have, a, have an advantage. Um, and that if there's a pay gap, perhaps their higher productivity might justify their higher pay. Um, 
could is this a problem therefore you know if we were recruiting a data analyst or something who works behind his computer all day um i doubt the recruiter would put any value on his or her looks at all what do you think is there a problem here uh i mean we it depends what stage you take it at so let's take the defense lawyer um example um now if i'm an employer of defense lawyers and i know attractive defense lawyers are better at winning over the jury then it is completely rational for me to employ attractive defense lawyers um if i am a, a jury and i am better won over by attractive people because I, I feel more empathy for them that that equally is an explanation for it as a society as a whole do we wish that to be the case uh, not just because we don't necessarily want to privilege attractive lawyers, um, but because we actually want jurors that make rational decisions. Um, and I guess the, the soft conclusion of my column is that almost always, I mean, perhaps with the exception of if you're actually working as a model, you know, almost always there is something within this that is probably suboptimal for society. And I don't think it's practical or appropriate to cut with laws to try to combat this. But I would like perhaps one of those jurors to think, am I letting this guy off simply because I have the hots for the defense lawyer? And if so, is that a sensible judicial system? Um, I, I, I think it's simply something it is worth being aware of because for perhaps perfectly reasonable evolutionary reasons, we quite clearly do prefer hotties um, and most of the time that's not actually that useful. Len, do you think we should be attempting to address this, um, what could you say, unconscious or, or conscious bias that we have? There's a couple of angles I, I, I would, first of all, um, you know, when we think about discrimination uh, in, in, in legal terms, we're often concerned with ascribed characteristics like, you know, you're born female, you're born black or whatever it may be. Um, is attractiveness uh, uh, an ascribed characteristic, or is it actually a produced characteristic? Um, I, I mean, I, I, an author who's a bit off the wall, but very interesting, is Catherine Huckin, who's written uh, extensively about what she calls erotic capital, which is a, a kind of extension of the idea of human capital. Human capital is where you invest in yourself, education, training, etc., to improve your marketability in the labor market. And she argues that erotic capital is a similar kind of thing. People invest in grooming, in haircuts, which I can't get at the moment, in all sorts of ways, uh, to, you know, plastic surgery, all sorts of things to enhance their attractiveness. It's not something which they're actually given and they can't do anything about. Now, uh, on that reasoning, if you want to, to sort of take measures against um, attractiveness, you should also take measures against people acquiring skills or education because that gives them an advantage in the labor market. So you could, you know, you could perhaps think about it in those terms when it looks, it looks rather different, I guess. Well, yes, people can always try and make themselves more attractive, but they can't change their uh, immutable characteristics. So in terms of the policy implications of this, Annabelle, do you foresee a time where we might want to deal with um, discrimination against ugly people in the same way as we deal with uh, discrimination against um, uh, a women, for example, or against people from different ethnic backgrounds in terms of the hiring process and in the workplace more generally? Do you think this could be a new gender pay gap type situation? Um, well, the short answer is no, uh, for many reasons. Um, it would be completely uh, impractical. I don't know how you would ever actually introduce um, something that would be the equivalent of a gender pay gap for attractiveness. I think Tom put it, you know, in his article that who would actually stand up and, and say that they were going to champion the rights of the ugly because unattractiveness isn't something that happens to you. It's something that, that other people are uh, affected by. Um, I mean, I mean, you could look to do uh, things like impose unconscious bias training in the way that um, has been done in other areas to try and prevent discrimination against women or uh, ethnic minorities, for instance, but given that this is so hardwired uh, into us, it's innate, it's instinctive, that you'd almost have to give 
babies and young children unconscious by straightening because we know from studies that babies um, like more attractive faces and that kids uh, are more likely to talk to strangers who are attractive than those who aren't. Um, so I think in terms of the policy, you know, implications or whether anything could be done about that, uh, it, it, it's nigh on impossible. And the idea that we would try and replicate the gender pay gap in any other area um, it, it would be very alarming to me because we know yeah. gender pay gap reporting has some real flaws, fundamental flaws. It places huge burdens on businesses and it doesn't reveal uh, anything that is, is useful in any way. All it really does is uh, lead to the unfair demonization of companies that have high gender pay gaps, which is often because, uh, to give the example of EasyJet, you have uh, me men and women employed in different roles at those companies. Men are overrepresented as pilots and women are overrepresented as flight attendants. Uh, so you have this unfair demonization of companies. And can you imagine if we started to have that over people's attractiveness <laughs> the fury that would uh, ensue um, and it, it just perpetuates this 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 victimhood narrative um, uh, among women talking specifically about gender pay gap here um, that I think worryingly leads young girls to believe that when it doesn't matter how hard they work or how clever they are or what qualities they may possess because they'll never be as successful as men just on account of their gender so not only would it would it be impossible to uh, implement uh, an ugliness pay gap, but it would also not be uh, desirable anyway. Yeah, um, Len, is there anything we could do? Is there any scope for any kind of intervention at all when it comes to this? Uh, I don't know. It, it depends. I mean, one interesting thing which which uh, has been done in relation to the um, male female discrimination is uh, blind auditions for musicians, right? Um, this makes a heck of a difference. If you can see the musicians, uh, you um, you know there's a strong bias in favour of males. A lot, lot of records on this. But if you put them behind a screen so you can't see who is playing, then women uh, are more likely to be chosen uh, at audition. Now you could imagine something like that, couldn't you? Where you could you could screen people at like like interviews. I suppose we're doing an online interview like this, you know. We could just do it sound only. Mind you, might run into problems about uh, accent discrimination or something like that. I don't know. But uh, you could actually uh, hide this characteristic in some situations, I guess. So something could be done about it. Whether it would be acceptable or not, I don't know. As for measuring it, which uh, Annabelle was talking about, I guess there are ways you could do this in large companies, civil service and stuff like that, where you could... I don't know, you could have uh, some artificial intelligence algorithm which would classify people as, as you know, above or, or, or below average looks or something. Uh, and then that could be used to, to, to uh, form a basis for a, a statistical pay gap. But would you really want to do that? Imagine the kind of objections to it, I guess. It sounds yeah. But I can actually imagine a, a scenario. I mean, the world has gone mad in many ways, so this would just be... Uh... I don't know, a logical next step from all the gender gap, gender pay gap stuff, perhaps. Um, Tom, I remember an interview with um, Katie Hopkins that went viral on one of these uh, morning TV chat shows. And she said, um, she said categorically that she would not hire an overweight person because she'd assume um, they'd be lazier than slimmer candidates. Should we just um, sort of accept that people are going to make assumptions based on appearance? And there's very little we can do about it. I know, as you said in your article, your overall sort of conclusion was that we just need to be a little bit more aware of our own biases in this way. Is it as simple as that? Possibly. Um, I, I received an email from someone after writing the article, um, and he said that um, as an employer, I'd love to see his company, but as an employer, he always employs the uglier or fatter candidate on the basis that they are underpriced, almost certainly, because of these inherent and, as he saw them, irrational biases in the employment market. Um, so he, he would be the sort of anti-Hopkins on, on that basis. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, we're, we're not going to reach a time where HR departments start rating people out of 10 and then sort of carefully 
monitoring what they're up to. Um, but humans have many mad biases um, and human society gets better by recognizing them. And just because we can't formulate a law that works, I, I don't think that's any reason not to recognize them. Um, you know, th there is there is an element of this that's sort of quite amusing, but I think possibly without getting too pious, we, sh we should examine why we find it amusing. Um, because you, you can't change some of these things. Yes, you can improve your looks, but ultimately you are born with what you're born with. Um, and we have, you know, Hopes in literature and fairy tales in, in all of our lives we're steeped in this idea of um you know that, that ugly is bad and that the hero is good looking and the heroine is good looking and these are arbitrary characteristics of birth that largely shouldn't impact on your ability to do anything in the world so uh, i think it's a very good thing if we just become more aware of it can i just come back on that emily yeah of course just one thing i would add is because we know that um, you know this is hardwired into us through evolution, I do agree with Tom. Of course, I do that we as a society should be made more aware of this issue. But I think what's what there's a risk that we place all of the onus on employers, say, and we talk about how they are discriminating against the ugly, rather than looking at how your attractiveness affects your self-esteem, how it affects your confidence, how it affects how you behave and what you uh, learn that you can really expect from life and therefore the kind of roles that you would go for. So I think that's just an, a kind of an additional element, an additional challenge of it, but something that I know Tom touched on in his um, piece. Um, and I would just also, question you know how we define success and even you know how how we define professional success because a frustration that I have when we talk about things like the gender pay gap is that we fixate on how much people are earning and we don't think about how there might be a motherhood penalty because women have taken time out of work to have children and they choose that to only go back part-time and people are paid less for a part-time hour than they are for a full-time hour so I think what we want is to create a society where there is choice um, of course where people aren't being discriminated against but also also one where we don't solely fixate on a salary as the single indicator of success and you know there are many other ways in which if you look at these studies and you take them at face value and you assume that they're sufficiently robust that attractive people you know don't don't always have the best lot in life for instance they are more likely to get divorced and wouldn't most of us here think that you know having a long and happy marriage is it's some kind of indicator of success yeah Len did you want to come in on that well so a, a couple of things one is, one is that uh, going back to the obesity thing I think uh, Obesity, again, is one of these things where is it an acquired characteristic or is it an ascribed characteristic? And, and uh, to the extent that people can alter their, their, their obesity or lack of obesity by their own behavior, then why, you know, why shouldn't Katie Hopkins be correct? I mean, I think she's completely over the top on that question, but there perhaps was a, a germ of an idea there, um, which was worth um, thinking about. Yeah, definitely. Um, so a little bit of a fun question to finish. Um, it's something that I asked a few friends before I, uh, before I, uh, when I was preparing for this, uh, for this panel. Um, do you think there is an optimal attractiveness to be in the workplace? Let's put aside modeling or, I don't know, sex work or media work or something. Do you think in general, for someone in an office, a corporate office, what would you think that a ranking out of 10 would be um, in terms of perhaps looking pleasant looking and attractive, but not intimidatingly or distractingly so? Asking for a friend, is this? <laughs> um. Um, out of interest, what would you put as the number? Is there one? I think I'm probably too hot to be a journalist. Um, I, I think it's better for everyone that I'm working from home and they can keep their mind on the job. <laughs> Annabelle. I fear that that question might be a two-parter and that if you were a female, the answer would be different to if you were male, simply because there are studies that have suggested that uh, women are less likely to promote 
other women uh, if they're too attractive because they feel threatened by them. Um, and so I think I think there could be something in that. So if, again, if it's just solely professional uh, success that you're striving for, then as a woman, you might do better off as, I don't know, six out of 10, but maybe if you're a man, you might do better off as an eight out of 10. I, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, these these studies were, were of course, uh, in relation to just simply above or below average. Uh, they, they weren't necessarily suggesting that being absolutely top of the range carried a much bigger premium uh, than, than, than the average person. So I, I, I don't really know about that. But I, I, another point which Annabelle mentioned, I just briefly ought to say something about, is the idea of pay as the only criterion here. I mean, I think as a labour economist, I always think in terms of net advantage of jobs in terms of compensating differentials and so on. For example, um, you know, there are a lot of talk recently about the way in which the, the, the returns on certain types of degree are lower than on others. And one uh, area where um, the return on, on degrees is very low is, is religious studies, right? Now, the people undertaking this want to serve God or whatever it may be. Uh, they're not interested in the pay. So just using pay as an indicator that to suggest that they're disadvantaged in some way, I think, is a mistake. And that's a, a general lesson uh, that I get in labour economics. You should always look at the overall picture rather than simply concentrating on pay. And I'm afraid pay gaps by themselves only give you a, a rather limited view of labour markets. And this is true right across the board. And I think it's true in relation to this beauty question as well. Yeah, could not agree more. Well, um, thank you all for joining me today for this panel on the economics of beauty. Um, to our audience, if you enjoyed this video, please do give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. We've got content coming out every day. Um, thank you for watching. <laughs>